Hi there. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Follow Your Passion podcast. I'm your host, Erwin Wils. I'm a mindset business strategist and founder of Millionaire Life Strategy. In this podcast, I'm interviewing my clients and other entrepreneurs that are following their passion and make a good living out of it. When you want to know more about me or what I can do for you, check out my website, millionairelifestrategy.com. But first, check out this episode of Follow Your Passion. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of the Follow Your Passion podcast. Let me introduce my guest of today. Her name is Tiffany Grant. She's the owner of Money Talk with Tiff, which is the name of both the company as, uh, as well as a podcast. She was a single mom of two boys, was going to school full time and worked two jobs trying to make ends meet. Now she's an accredited financial counselor, has finished her MBA and runs a successful business. She calls herself a self-proclaimed money nerd and is proud of it. She lives and breathes finances. Tiffany acts as a financial wellness facilitator and an advocate for financial literacy. And I also have seen that you call yourself the financial literacy evangelist. So welcome, (laughs) Tiffany. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Yes, I'm an evangelist spreading the gospel of financial literacy everywhere. <laughs> nice. So as I understand it correctly, also from your website, it already started when you were at a very early age, right? Yeah. So um, my relationship with money, um, going back probably as far as I can remember, I think the earliest was probably about five years old or so. Uh, My grandma actually told me that I used to charge my grandpa um, for doing like extra chores, like um, taking out his garbage and stuff like that. Um, So I've always had a passion for money um, and also monetizing, um, you know, what I'm interested in. And so from as far back as I can remember, that started very young. Nice. And you've stayed true to your path, so to speak. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, today, now I know that there's a term for it. I consider myself a serial entrepreneur um, because literally everything that I have a passion for, I've found a way to monetize it. And, you know, sometimes our passions change or what we like change. And every time I'll pivot to a new way to make money. So, <laughs> Yeah. So how did you make this transition from uh, working two jobs you know to 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 make to make a living to survive so to speak to owning your own business yeah so i would say it was very very hard <laughs> um you know when you was reading my bio i was almost in tears i was like oh my gosh like i have come a long way and sometimes you don't realize that when you're in the thick of it um but looking back it was a very difficult time um i've been a single mom since i was well i had my first son when i was 18 and ever since then um you know, going through school, uh, working two jobs at times that were only making like $10 or so an hour. And so just trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, how to optimize my money. um, So that way I can make a way for me and my kids. And I will tell you, so during that time, I was living off of um, tax refund checks, student uh, refund checks. Um, like I would get my refund checks and pay up my rent for at least, you know, how far I can go because I was like, at least we can have a roof over our head if nothing else. So, you know, during that time, you know, it was very boots on the ground. Um, sometimes going further than working two jobs, I would do Uber and Lyft. I would still do other side hustles and, during all of that, I realized that I had paid off like $50,000 in debt. So not only was I making ends meet, but I was also making enough extra money and paying that debt off because that was my sole uh, purpose in life at that time. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get rid of this stuff. I hate it. it. It feels like a cloud over my head. And so what's the fastest way possible I can do this? Nice. Um. So what would you say that your relation to money is? Yeah, so it's complicated, right? <laughs> and I All think relations people, are. <laughs> right? <laughs> I think most people would think that as well. Um, I know 
from when I was younger, uh, nobody in my family ever taught me about money. And honestly, everybody in my family was spenders. And so, you know, they utilize credit to its fullest extent, um, AKA as income. And so I noticed how, you know, credit card stacks were getting taller, um, bankruptcies, foreclosures in my immediate family. And I was like, you know what? I don't know if I want that type of life. Like for me as a kid, it was awesome because I got whatever I wanted. But um, as I started understanding what was happening, you know, around the 2008, 2009 crisis, crisis. Um, I was like, you know what? I don't know if this is the life I want. And actually me and my mom were just having this conversation the other day because she was like, yeah, when you were younger, you wanted name brand everything and you wouldn't even get out the car at the thrift stores and this, that, and the other. And then she said, look at you now. She was like, once you had your own kids, now I promise you everything we wear is either thrift or on sale. Um, so it's like, as you understand how money works, you know, which I started doing, then you start looking th at things a little bit different. And um, I want to say the big pivotal moment as far as like where clothes and stuff were concerned was when I started working at a thrift store. And then I noticed that this is where all the doctors and lawyers and people that were really well off in my city were coming to shop. And I was like, huh, interesting. <laughs> so then that kind of opened my mind to actually shopping there. And then now I'm like, that's the only thing that I do is thrift and buy off the clearance rack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, um, one of my coaches, uh, sometimes said that, um, if you could buy an Island, you know, buy a, ho a house at the lake, if you can mm -hmm. buy your own plane, fly first class, if you could buy a Ferrari, you know, drive a Mercedes. And I think that's that's actually a wise lesson. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm so glad you said that because a lot of what happens sometimes is what we call lifestyle creep, right? So as you make more money, your lifestyle starts going up. So, you know, you start spending more on different things and so on and so forth. And honestly, that has been my biggest secret um, over the years. Not really a secret because I talk about it, but <laughs> that has been one of my biggest tips. We'll say it that way um, over the years is to not allow lifestyle creep to creep in. So I live live the exact same way I did when I was struggling, <laughs> um, even to this day. And it's not because, you know, I don't have the money to do things. I do. It's just that I would rather put my money towards things that I deem as important to me. So like, for instance, uh, I just, for the whole month, almost of August, I was traveling. I think I was only, when I looked at the calendar, I think I was only at home maybe 10 days out of the entire month. <laughs> um, and I was like, you know, that was money well spent for me. Technology is money well spent for me. Um, and so I tell people all the time, you don't have to guilt yourself into, um, you know, budgeting and all that stuff. Um, as long as you are spending your money on what's important to you, then all is well. And when I work with my clients and they first start working with me, they're like, oh my gosh, I have a meeting with Tiffany. Oh, she's going to kill me. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like this anxiety thing. And I'm like, don't never feel like that because the only thing I'm going to ask you is, okay, where are we pulling it from? You know, we all have infinite, um, not infinite, finite resources, right? Um, and so some of us have infinite, don't get me wrong, but most of us have finite resources. So if, if you spend on something, that's fine. But now you have to figure out where is that additional money going to come? from. Um, so that's really the key to being successful in, you know, having your financial goals, um, paying off debt, whatever they may be, is making sure that everything balances out and you know where you're going. Nice. So if you look at the financial world, you know, there's a difference between uh, spending and investing, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of hypes around building passive income. So what's your view on, on passive income? Because it's never as passive as people say it is or try to make you believe it is. Absolutely. So, um, okay. So I'll say this. Um, when it comes to passive income, right? And let's do air quotes passive. 
a lot of times, even if you get it to the point where it starts making you money and you really don't have to do anything, it's going to take time to build up to that point. So a lot of people look at me and they're like, oh, Tiffany, she has passive income and all this stuff. But I have been doing this for five plus years. I don't even know what year I'm on right now. Um, I've been doing this for a long, long, long time. I mean, up late, up early, you know, just grinding it out. And people don't see that background. And so that would be my first caution to people. Like when you see other people making this quote unquote passive income, uh, just realize that you're not seeing the whole story um, for one. And to just put that in perspective. Now, do I believe that you should have multiple streams of income? Yes. Now, do they all have to be passive? No. Um, for instance, when I was working in corporate, I was in HR, but I was doing money talk with Tiff on the side. I was doing Uber and Lyft on the side. And it was just what I wanted to do. So I feel, you know, my thing is don't get too caught up in what the Joneses are doing or what other people are doing, because you could be looking at their chapter 25 and you're at chapter two, at chapter one, right? And so always do what feels right for you. And that's pretty much how I've lived my life. And so I was like, you know, if I was working in HR, I would go home and work on Money Talk with Tiff because that was my passion project. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it started making money, <laughs> but that wasn't the original goal. It was just something that I enjoyed doing. And so that's kind of also how I coach people around, you know, finding what their passion is and then finding a way to monetize it if they want to. Now, there's some passions that I have that I don't want to monetize because I want it to keep it a passion. Um, also yeah. realize that once you start monetizing something, sometimes it will become a chore. And so if it's something that you really enjoy and you're like, you know what, I think I'm I'm good with enjoyment, um, then it's okay to leave it there as well. Yeah, nice. And I really liked what you said that um, sometimes when people are in it for the money, you know, they might be in business for the wrong reasons. And it's my belief that you're in business to add value. Uh, money's not the goal. It's the results of the value you add. Would you agree to that? Absolutely. And this goes for everybody. So whether you're an entrepreneur or you're working a nine to five, you're a W-2 employee, regardless, I tell people do not do things for money. Every time I tried to do things for money, I ended up miserable. <laughs> you know, when I took a job that was making like double, triple my salary, I ended up miserable at that job. Um, when I started a business that had nothing to do with what I was interested in, I ended up miserable, even though it made up both times. I made a ton of money. Money was not everything because then what started happening, I started getting stressed out. My health started suffering. Um, my quality of life wasn't where it was. And so, you know, you kind of have to look at the holistic picture of who you are and where you want to be. Um, you know, just don't do things for money. Definitely do it for what makes you feel good and, you know, being able to sustain yourself. Yeah, I can I can totally agree with that. Um, but I, I understand that um, it's a mindset, right? And especially if people are starting the business, they want to make an income as fast as possible. So they, they might do things for the money uh, only to realize that the clients they took on aren't their ideal clients and they actually didn't want to work with them. If they've truly listened to the feeling, right? If they've mm -hmm. listened to the gut feeling, they should have said no, but because it it were potential paid clients, they would say yes. And well, don't have to tell you what the result will be. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because that happened to me recently. So I've been in business for quite some time, right? And um, there's someone that, you know, kept coming to me. They wanted me to work on a project. And I kept saying no. I was like, you know, this is not within my wheelhouse. I really don't want to do it. Um, but they came to me again. And so I was like, Okay, let me just quote some crazy price. Um, and then hopefully that'll say, you know, that'll be a no in a different way. Well, yeah. lo and behold, they ended up paying it. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh no, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think sometimes and and 
let me just be transparent as well. During the time where I was like, I decided to quote and all that stuff, I was going through a tough time in my business. I was like, okay, this would be a, a easy, you know, low hanging fruit, you know, let me just go ahead and quote something, whatever, whatever. Um, So like, it was a type of thing where I was like, if, if they say yes, okay. If they say no, okay. You know, whatever. So they ended up saying yes. And I did not want to do the project um, mm. at all. And it ended up being a cloud over my head for, um, you know, until it was completed because, you know, I was every morning I would wake up. I'm like, oh, I got to do this. Oh, I got to do that. So it wasn't fun anymore. You know, it kind of took the fun out of what I do. So um, always be aware with that. Even if you are a seasoned entrepreneur or business owner or what have you, um, it's okay to say no and stick to your guns. <laughs> you know, even if they're family, friends, whomever, um, if it's something that does not agree with what you have going on or your passions or where you plan to go with your business, it is okay to say no. And I just learned that lesson again. And sometimes you need to remember uh, things again. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, they say um, only a fool thinks they know everything. So. <laughs> exactly. Right. So um, with your money mindset and you've got, uh, uh, currently you've got two teenage boys, I think. So I have one son that's 13 and one that's eight. Ah, um, do they, do you already, uh, well, training is a hard word, but do you already share your knowledge and work on the money mindset as well? Absolutely. Um, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is something that wasn't given to me when I was growing up. And, you know, come to find out on one side of my family, they were real estate moguls. And I'm like, if somebody would have said something, um, you know, maybe I could have learned, you know, from that side of the family before, you know, people passed away or health started deteriorating or what have you. And so now, you know, for instance, with my oldest son, I had him on one of my lives recently, you know, just saying like what types of things he has learned, you know, over the years or what have you. And because he turned 13 this year, one of his, um, you know, I guess, uh, path, pathways to adulthood um, was I allowed him to open up a checking account and get a debit card. And so he was able to put his money into that account. But I was like, but he can't just go willy nilly. Um, you have to create a budget <laughs> to, you know, figure out how you're going to spend that money. Because of course, with kids and a lot of times with adults too, if you're not aware, you'll start spending money before you even get it, right? So in his head, he's like, oh, I want to get this. I want to pre-order this game. I want to do that. I want to do that. And I'm like, well, you know, you only have a hundred dollars. So, <laughs> you know, you kind of have to figure out where you want to put that money. Or if you want to save some and get a bigger ticket item later, you know, so I, I have my kids walk through those things. Um, when they're younger, I start them off with the um, spin, save, and giveaway. So for instance, anytime they get money in, so like maybe for birthdays, Christmas, what have mm -hmm. you, maybe a stranger on the street, give them a dollar, whatever. Um, <laughs> they have to uh, put money in each of those categories. Why? Because it teaches them you can't spend everything you have to save some and it's okay to give away some of your money. Um, it's okay to donate, you know? Um, so those are the three things that the three quote unquote envelopes that as they're growing up, you know, I would say I started that probably around four ish. Um, when they're like four and a little and older, they have to put at least something into each one. Now, I don't dictate what goes into where because that's completely their decision. So, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> one of my sons, he's a spender. So he's like, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and put 10 cent in the giveaway. And then the rest is mine now. Um, but <laughs> I give them that autonomy to make those decisions themselves. They just know that they have to put something in each one. Nice, nice. And I recognize with my own boys as well. I remember when they were at, uh, I think the the last class of the, the, the uh, of the primary school, mm -hmm. right? And they wanted a mobile phone, but we already gave them a mobile phone. But it was one of those those phones that you could drop from three meters down without it hurting. You know, it was waterproof, and you could call with it and send uh, SMS messages, right? Mm -hmm. Short mm -hmm. messages, but 
that was not the smartphone they had in mind because you couldn't put WhatsApp on it, uh, play games and stuff. And they wanted that. So I said, well, you know, you, you, you got a phone, you can call, we, we can call you. So that's fine. If you want something more, you have to work for it. Mm-hmm. So that's when they had to, uh, to sign up for distributing newspapers, you know, and uh, advertisement folders from, from companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they could pay for a subscription with a smartphone. Um, mm-hmm. My oldest one did. He already had a he already had a smartphone in mind that he wanted to have. Um, my youngest one, he was looking at my old phone, and he said, "When you want, uh, when you're buying a new one, I want your old phone." So he he was a bit uh, more effective, I would say. But that's how they learned also to to. You can't spend uh, you can't spend money you don't have, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, the young one loves to cook and he's making dinner once a week. So mm-hmm. we're giving him a budget of, let's say, 15 euros. So it's a, currently it's around $15 as well. Mm-hmm. And he has to buy his own groceries mm-hmm. and make money for the four of us. And uh, what he also does is he's looking in the closets to see what's already available so you don't have to buy it. Mm. So he's he's actually smart thinking about that. And that's um, but that's how they learn, you know, and that's how they grow. And you want them to become independent, you know, that, that they can take care of themselves. And right. that's um yeah, I, I think that's that's also what you're doing, you know, with the, the saving and the spending and, and charity. I think the charity is very great that you already put it in there for on, on an early age mm-hmm. because um you know, people also believe that if you're giving, then it will return to you. Absolutely. And that's, I, that's the beauty yeah. of it. I wholeheartedly believe that. So, you know, my kids, they grew, because I mean, we, we thrived, right? So if somebody didn't give that away, we wouldn't have like, for instance, this dress that I have on, right? And so like with my kids, ever since they were young, anytime they grow out of stuff, we have giveaway bags by the door. So, you know, if you can't fit something, go ahead and put in the giveaway bag. If it's a toy that you don't play with, go ahead and put in the giveaway bag. And we donate all the time. It's so very important um, because also I believe that money is an energy exchange and Mm -hmm. so in order to keep that flow going you have to keep exchanging energy you can't hoard it all because then it's not going to come back to you um so then another thing too though and I'm glad that you're teaching your kids as well because at the end of the day it starts at home right so if we're not teaching them these things they're not going to learn it in school they're just going to grow up clueless like most of us um so it's best to go ahead and get your kids on board get them learning you know even little things like what you had mentioned what I had mentioned and just start them off early and even if if you don't feel competent enough to do that then I had one lady she made her daughter make an appointment with me um just because she was like I don't know what I don't know, but I want her to learn. And so you can do that as well. Um, And then the daughter had to pay for it with the money that she made over the summer. So, (laughs) you know, you have to um, kind of think outside the box sometimes, but, you know, whatever it is there, the resources are out there. It's just up to you to find them. Exactly. It it reminds me of, um, it's beautiful that you said that because, uh, you know those this saying about uh, opportunity knocks, right? Mm-hmm. And I saw a quote uh, lately of uh, that a fellow entrepreneur used, and she sh- the quote was, "If uh, if opportunity doesn't knock, build your own door," right? Mm-hmm. And I didn't hear I didn't hear it before, so but it it didn't resonate with me. So I thought, you know, it should actually be if opportunity doesn't knock. Remove your earplugs <laughs> because I think opportunities are everywhere. Just like you said, you know, it's just, you have to, li- you, you have to see it. You have to take your blinders off and look for it. And if you look for it, you will find it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I have so many conversations on a daily basis because my mind is always thinking about business. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I could just be talking to somebody, random conversation. I'm like, 
have you thought about, you know, <laughs> did you know that you can make money doing that? You know, that type of thing. Yeah. And it's all around us. We just don't see it or we don't hear it, you know? Um, and sometimes if you don't, it might take a prof- somebody that is specialized in doing that in order to see it for you. Like, I will tell you um, what had changed my career when I was, you know, working my way up the corporate ladder was mm. hiring a coach that changed my whole trajectory because she saw things in a different way than I saw things. And that's what made me move up as quick as I did, because had I been left to my own devices, I don't think I would be where I am now. (laughs) You know, you know, it, it, we don't see our own blind spots. Mm -hmm. Sometimes all that is needed is to mirror what you're saying. Absolutely. And that's, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. But it's, it, would you also say that uh, besides all financial investments, that the best invest, investment you can make is in yourself? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm also a nerd, so full disclosure. But um, I believe in educating yourself as much as possible. The reason I became an expert in money was because I immersed myself in magazines and podcasts and blogs and social media where people were, you know, posting about different things. Like that's how I learned all of this stuff for the most part. And then I just got some of the book knowledge, you know, not too long ago in the grand scheme of things. So it's like, is so much information out there. We are in the age of information. So if there's something, anything that you're curious about, you can go out there and find it. It's out there. You just have yeah. to be the one to find it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I was already thinking about uh, how a brand became a word, you know, because <laughs> nowadays we just say you can just Google it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, do you also keep up with all those latest trends, you know, like the cryptocurrencies, the NFTs, the 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 forex and stuff like that? So so personally, okay, so I know about it just so I can educate people, but do I personally invest in any of that stuff? No. Um and the reason is because, you know, Warren Buffett, which everybody knows Warren Buffett, but um he said if you don't fully understand something, then don't invest in it. And I feel like that is the soundest financial advice you could ever take. If you don't fully understand something, what are you doing putting your money into it? And so I tell people that all the time, whether it's, you know, the cryptos, the NFTs, all that stuff, or even if they're just looking at like the um, MLMs and stuff like that, I'm like, if you don't fully understand what's going on, then maybe that's not where you should put your investments. So I live by that advice. And so I only put my money into things that I fully understand. So what is that? That's the stock market, you know, that's index funds, that's mutual funds. Like I understand all of that stuff because I know how to read the um, fundamentals, you know, Mm -hmm. their books and things like that. Um, And so that's the stuff that I invest in. Now, is it like, could it be a good investment for people? Maybe. Um, It depends on how much work you want to put into it, how much you want to learn about it, because that goes back to my original point. Um, So there are definitely people making money, but it just depends on if that's where you want to make money. Like, I don't feel like people should get sucked into trends, Um, you know, and, and honestly, there's been studies being done over the years about investing and following trends actually means that you're late to the to the party anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, nice. yeah. So the people that, you know, are that started it. So like, let's say, for instance, a new cryptocurrency or what have you. Um, so the person that started it. And they have sensationalized it. Now everybody's hopping in. So now the price is going up and now you hear about it. Well, guess what? You're already catching it on the incline. So you're not getting the same returns as that person that started it. Um, And that's with any type of investment. So I say that to say, personally, I don't invest in them. But if it's something that interests you, go out and educate yourself and then, you know, choose if you want to do it or not. Yeah, and especially the part in the middle that you said, I think that's that's the key to most things, you know, educate yourself about it and mm-hmm. then decide whether or not you want to do it. Um, Absolutely. It, it's also nice that you uh, um, mentioned MLM systems, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, I've tried a few and mm-hmm. 
for me, it only works when I fully believe in the service or product you're selling, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, for instance, I th it's already from, from the old ages, you know, but uh, Tupperware was a very mm. good MLM system because mm -hmm. they delivered high quality products, right? Mm. And you had those household parties where where the the, the host uh, would get presents, you know, and uh, they invited other, mostly mothers, right, or housewives, and they bought uh, Tupperware mm -hmm. stuff. But it's great stuff. You get quality, and there's no issue promoting that because it's just great stuff, right? But what mm -hmm. I've noticed that a lot of those MLM. Uh, ambassadors i would call them mm -hmm. they're selling it for the mlm system so for the bonuses you know if if you if you bring in uh three friends you're getting some money and if they bring friends you get more you know and and they're selling the system as well let's call it what they say uh, like a passive income right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in my opinion, if you sell it like that, it becomes like a pyramid scheme, right? Mm -hmm. And I can only promote an MLM system if the people that get in don't need to get other people in, mm. mm -hmm. right? If if you're a big fan of uh, let's let's take Tupper again, right? Mm -hmm. And if you buy Tupperware and you're so uh, you're so enthused about the product that you promote it to your to your friends, you know you should use Tupperware. It's great, you know, and that's that's great if they're uh, if they can only buy it. But there's no don't say you know you should become an ambassador and sell Tupperware. And if you make other ambassadors, you're getting money. And that nowadays that at least in the Netherlands, I see that as a trend that people are selling the MLM system instead of the service or the product. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when I'm, you know, when people come to me and they're like, oh, Tiffany, what do you think about this MLM or what have you? Um, one of my biggest tips is to ask for the income disclosure statement. All of them have to give it to you, at least if they're regulated by the U.S. And usually in the income disclosure statement, you can see how much people are really making because it has to be accurate numbers. And so a lot of times you'll see, you know, because, you know, you'll go to the, the meetings or what have you in the presentations and they really sensationalize things. But then when you get that document, you're like, oh, wait a minute, that's only like the 0.01% of people that do this. Um, so definitely check that out as part of your research. And then also just to tag on to your point, I have a good example. One of my friends, um, she's in a health and wellness one. Now, she doesn't really promote it. Honestly, she says she just got it because she uses the products and she wanted the discount. Um, and so there's not there's nothing wrong with MLMs and stuff as long as you're doing them correctly, as long as you're utilizing them correctly. Um, because nobody likes for to be harassed, first of all. I could, I don't know if I'm speaking for myself, but um, you know, when people are like, oh, you should try, da, 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 please join, da, da, da. and I'm just like, this is not this is not it. Um, and so like, for instance, if you're using it for the discount, cool, you know, I'm all about a discount. Um, or if you're like, um, you, you know, if you have clients that come to you and they're like, oh, I know you're an uh, ambassador. I want to buy from you. Cool. But like you were saying, you know, when it comes to recruiting people and stuff like that, mm, like for me, I'm just like, eh, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just a modern version of the pyramid scheme we had. Uh, I remember uh, when I was young and my father got some uh, a visit from a friend or somebody he knew, and they were explaining, you know, if you get in, you would pay uh, just 100 euros. You know, oh, back then it were uh, still guilders, <laughs> but let's say euros, you know, for the, ease, uh, for the sake of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And... Um, then uh, you bring in three new people, you know, and when you're at level three or so, 
then you will receive 500. So you're making five times the money you put into it, right? Mm -hmm. And luckily my father never got in because, you know, it's there are always people at the bottom, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it makes it so that, um, you know, if you really look at it, right, um, even like, let's say, for instance, there's people that do great with the recruiting aspect, they get people on, blah, blah, blah. There's always, like you said, going to be someone at the bottom, and maybe they can't get those two people or three people that they need or what have you. And so they end up losing money. So like the people that are at the top or, you know, further up the pyramid, they're not thinking about the people that they're bringing in and what a detrimental effect that it could have on them. Um, and, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the pyramid schemes and stuff, because I remember being younger, little, and my aunt would go to these meetings. And this was before it was regulated, you know, and before they called it MLM, because now all yeah. they do is put a product to it um, <laughs> to get around that. But um I, she used to go to these meetings and she would take me with her and I'm just sitting there like as a child, like this sounds like BS. Like, What is this? <laughs> and so I had those early experiences, luckily. So I've never participated in any of them. Um, like I've had like parties if I was interested in the product um, just so I can get the free stuff. Um, but other than that, I've never like signed up to to be a distributor, ambassador, or whatever they're called, um, just because it doesn't align with what I do and where I decide that I want to go. So, you know, I say that to say, if it fits your passions and you enjoy the product or what have you, by all means, you know, do your research, figure out if it's right for you. But I just know for me personally, it's just not a good fit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's... Um... I think that that at least if you're, um, I always say that the best salesmen, right, are your uh, children and your friends and family mm -hmm. because they just want to share an experience with you, mm -hmm. right? They want to do the best for you because they care about you. And with an MLM system, it's, it's, well, let's cut it short. You know, it's not working for me unless I fully believe in the product or service. Mm -hmm. And then I have no problem promoting it or advising somebody the, so they can benefit from it as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nice. And see, the thing is, like, I'm one of those family members, like... <laughs> If you come to me trying to sell something like that and I'm not interested, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to say, uh, yeah, no, I'm not interested. Like, I'm not going to waste your time. Um, and see, I feel like, you know, that that goes into another lesson. People need to be more comfortable, I guess, going back, saying no, right? Um, so it's okay to say no. Trust me, all those relationships are still intact. Nobody has cut me off because I didn't buy their product or what have you. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just like, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want my time to be wasted. I'm not interested, but I will support you in other ways. Um, and so that's yeah. usually how I handle those types of things. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hearing your talk, I would say a lot of people would need your services. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you get your clients? Is it worth of mouth or... How, how does it work for you? Yeah. So originally when I started the business, it was mainly social media. So I love digital marketing. Um, I actually started a firm doing that. So if people are interested in digital marketing services, I can help you. Um, but that's how I started and built my business. Now it's more word of mouth. So when I get speaking engagements or new clients or anything like that, a lot of it is referrals. Um, and so I make sure that I do a good job for the people that trust me um, because, you know, financial stuff or even business stuff, personal stuff, um, it's very, very, um, you know, it, it takes courage and I don't want to 
um, abuse that in any way. And mm-hmm. so um, because I talk about that a lot too, uh, financial trauma. So for instance, if somebody goes to an advisor and they don't have enough assets, you know, and then the advisor just ghosts them and they never hear from them again, that's financial trauma. And could because they reached out and they were like, oh, you know, I want to get my money going and da 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 da. And then they realize, oh, wait, am I not good enough? You know, so I don't want to be that financial trauma to people. So um, I always, always treat my clients, you know, just like we're talking now and everything comes from referrals for the most part now. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we could talk hours about money and how it works and how to make it and deal with it. If, If you could share one last tip or little piece of wisdom with the audience, what would it be, Tiffany? Yeah. So um, one of the quotes that I live by um, is everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. Right. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, like that's how I live my life. So I do a lot of what other people might consider risky things. You know, when I quit my full time job or, you know, I bought a house as a single mom, whatever. Um, But I said my thing is, if I'm really scared of something, it might be the best thing that ever happened to me. And if it's not, then maybe it's a lesson that I needed to learn. So my thing is, um, whenever you encounter fear, step over it. Just just take the courage and step over it because it could be the best thing that ever happened to you. So that's kind of how I live my life. And I also have another saying, instead of um, ready, aim, fire, it's um, ready, fire fire aim (laughs) it's usually how it so you know I'll get ready enough but I don't do too much analysis paralysis because that can happen as well when you get too far in the weeds you're like I want to research everything nothing is ever going to be perfect you have to put it out there in order for it to thrive in order for you to learn what you need to learn so all of that to say step over fear get it out there whatever it is (laughs) Nice, nice. Great advice. Uh, I can truly resonate with that. Uh, So if people want to know more about you, Tiffany, or get in touch with you, how can you do that? Absolutely. So my home base is moneytalkwitht.com. You can find everything about me there. You can also find me on all the social media platforms because I told you I'm a junkie. Um, (laughs) And that's at moneytalkwitht. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, LinkedIn, just literally everywhere. And if you don't see me somewhere, let me know so I can make a profile. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's how you can get in contact with me. Nice. Nice. Are you already on TikTok as well? Yeah, I'm on TikTok. I make some TikTok videos. Um, TikTok <laughs> is a little more fun for me. So if you want to see the fun side of Tiffany, you can go over there. <laughs> nice. And of course, people can listen to your your own podcast as well, right? Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't know why I always forget. But yes, you can find me um, at the Money Talk with Tiff podcast, wherever you listen to your podcast, I'm there. And if you don't see me there, like I said, let me know and I'll make sure I get there. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, Tiffany, for being my guest. You've got some great energy with you. I love talking mm-hmm. to you. So uh, thanks again. And let's keep in touch. Thank you so much, Erwin. It was my pleasure. I hope you liked this episode. Make sure to check out the other episodes because each one is filled with interesting and inspiring stories and energy. Are you following your passion as well and make a good living out of it? Contact me and you could be my next guest. Would you like to follow your passion but are not there yet? Check out my website millionairelifestrategy.com and book an appointment to discover what I could do for you. Don't forget to share the podcast with your friends so that they get inspired as well. 